Welcome to Shelf Life, the monthly series where I look back at games I covered about six months ago and let you know whether they stayed in my collection or for Kickstarters whether I decided to get a copy of the game for myself. And for this month I'm looking back at games I covered in September of 2020. And before I get to the list, feel free to comment as you watch. Which games have you called recently? Or which of the ones that I got rid of are you yelling at the screen for me being such a fool over? Let me know. And don't forget I give away a free game for every episode so hang on until the end if you want to hear who our winner is this month. But enough talk, let's go ahead and see which of these games had shelf life. We're starting out with Magic Maze on Mars, a real-time game taking the Magic Maze formula and altering it up in several ways, and a game that is unfortunately still not available in the US. So did this one hang on in my collection? For now, yes it did. I'll be honest that after playing both of them a bunch, I slightly prefer the original Magic Maze, especially with the Maximum Security expansion. But Magic Maze on Mars is different enough to remain fun, and my son really likes it. When I talked about doing this episode, he said I could not get rid of it. That happened with several games you'll hear about. And on top of that, the fact that it still doesn't have US distribution means that if I got rid of it, I'd probably have a really hard time getting it back if I changed my mind, so for now, I'm keeping it around. Next is Breakin' Alcatraz, one of the games in the Breakin' series, an escape room game where you use manipulatives and 3D space to solve puzzles. So did this one manage to break its way into my collection for good? Nope. There's nothing wrong with this one, but it's the kind of game that I'm going to pass on to my friends and get out of my collection because once you've played it, you've seen it all. Now, I will say that the Break-In series based on this one game is cool compared to things like Unlock and Exit and such. Because of the 3D spatial element in solving the puzzles, that definitely felt new and unique and kind of had more toy factor. The wow of opening up the box and seeing like the next thing inside because you're slowly opening up each piece is really, really cool. But I didn't like the puzzles as much as something like Unlock, which is one of the only ones of these types of games that I always make sure to play every single one of. So I don't know if I'll buy too many more break-in entries after this one, but the first one was still pretty fun. Next is Scythe, the farming game mixed with a giant robot battle game that I had covered previously, but covered again when I featured it with the modular board and the uh, airship expansion. So Scythe was one of my top 10 solo games of all time back when I did my list maybe a year or two ago. Is it still hanging on? Nope, it's gone. So here's the thing. I still think Scythe is a great game, a fun design. I especially like it with the Fenris expansion and the variety that has and the campaign you can play through. But the big thing is I was basically only playing this for solo. It's not the type of game I really want to play competitive. It's a little bit too cutthroat and that combat system can be so frustrating. And the more and more I played solo, the more I found that it got very samey. Very, very samey. The AI, as good as it is, I love the Automa Factory's work. I just tends to do the same things over and over again, and I found that the same strategies would crush them, or at least do very well against them, even on the highest difficulty settings. So once I got that feeling, and this is like, you know, 20 or 25 plays in, I decided it wasn't worth it to take up all that space for my collection, so I had to let it go. Next we have Too Many Bones, another game you've seen me discuss a whole bunch, a great adventure game from Chip Theory. So is this one still hanging around? It definitely is, but you'll have to take my word for it because I got the Trove chest, and there's no way I'm lugging that thing out. <laughs> So Too Many Bones, wow, what a journey. If you heard my review with Peter back when we first started off the podcast, I was pretty negative on it. And I do think it's a game that has gotten better in later editions and later reprints. The rules have gotten clear. They've had better support. And I also think it's a game that gets way better if you're willing to invest the tons of money you need to get a lot of the expansion because it is an expensive game. But wow, once you do, this is one of my top co-op and solo games of all time at this point. I love the variety. I love the gear locks, the leveling, the battle, how quick the game can be to play depending on which tyrant you go with, the options they've added for expansions with campaign play and the splice and dice mode. Definitely a big recommend. Again, if you're willing to uh, drop hundreds of dollars potentially, uh, a good one to check out. Next is Escape the Dark Sector, the follow-up to Escape the Dark Castle, a throwback adventure game with solo and co-op play. So do I really need a Dark Castle and a Dark Sector in my life? I guess so. Escape the Dark Castle, the previous game in the series, has kind of a funny shelf life history because I called it and then my son got so upset with me for doing so and I posted about it. And you all probably know the board gaming community is amazing. So somebody saw that post and actually sent me another copy of it. So I got it back in my collection, which made my son so happy. 
and he loves Escape the Dark Sector perhaps even more. I kind of think uh, Dark Castle is better for simple play, but Dark Sector I like the slightly more complex combat better, so they're both good. And yes, I did uh, go in with the newest Kickstarter for the expansion materials for Dark Sector, so I imagine this will stay around for quite some time. It's a lot of fun. Next is 65, a tactical skirmish game set in the Vietnam War, and I focused on the solo play when I covered it. So you know I like to cover a lot of war games, but they can be hit or miss for me. Did this one stick around? No, I guess it's alone in the jungle again. So 65 is a fine game. I liked a lot of the skirmish details and mechanics in it, but I was focusing on it for solo play. This is, again, not the type of game I'm going to play competitively. It's just not in uh, my favorite kind of wheelhouse to shoot at each other in this kind of combat. And the solo system I thought worked well, but I thought it was too limited. Didn't have enough scenarios and enough variety in replaying those scenarios to be worth it if I'm not going to play the skirmish game. So if you're going to get this and play it 1v1, the solo is a great add-on to give you more options, but in and of itself, it's not worth it to buy the entire package just for solo play, in my opinion. Next, we have Forgotten Waters from Plaid Hat Games, an app-based game where you control a party of pirates, sometimes competing against each other, but trying to solve a variety of story-based quests. So Forgotten Waters has something I usually hate, a little bit of semi-co-op in the mechanics. Did it stick around? Yo-ho-ho, it did. So this is another one that I kept partially because my son really asked me to. He had a lot of fun when we played a couple of the scenarios, and this is actually one that the whole family got behind. My wife played, and even my five-year-old kind of got in on the action. Now, to be clear, and I said this in our podcast, I said this in the review, this is a game that tends to overstay its welcome. It's definitely one I think you want to play in multiple sessions. It only really has like six or seven plays in it once you've seen all the scenarios and not much to come back to. So once we've gone through all of them, I think it will be leaving my collection. But it is a fun romp while it lasts and it has some of the best humor I've ever seen in a board game. So since my son wants to play it, I'm definitely going to hang on to it, but not forever. Next is The Gallerist, my first Euro game designed by Lacerda that I've covered. The Gallerist is a somewhat heavy Euro, not usually my bag. Did this one make the cut? Nope. I said in my review that the mechanics of the Gallerist are great, and it really impresses me with Lacerda's general design style. It makes me want to check out more of his games. Like, I've got Lisboa. I don't know if you can see it, but it's over my shoulder. I'm definitely going to check out that one. But I've heard somewhat more mixed things about Lacerda in terms of solo play, and at least for the Gallerist, I totally agree. I don't think the AI does almost anything, which means I'm free to follow very similar strategies from game to game, and it just didn't feel varied enough in play without those other players to change things up and force me to rethink my strategy. Strategies. Next is the only Kickstarter we're looking at this week, The Seventh Citadel, the follow-up to The Seventh Continent. I can't show the box, obviously. This game is going to take years to finish, but did I back it? You bet I did. My feelings on the previous game, Seventh Continent, are pretty complicated. I was enthralled by it and really loved my play for a while, but then the repetitiveness and how crushing it can be when you lose and having to redo parts and grind through things eventually got frustrating, but at least from what I've seen so far, it seems like 7 Citadel has pretty much fixed all of those things, and especially with a few house rules, because I don't think I'm going to uh, play through a 50-hour campaign and then repeat the entire thing if I die at the end. Uh, with a few tweaks, I imagine, I expect this to be a top game for me, or at least a top game experience, even if I finish it up and then never play it again. Getting to the end, our second to last game is The Hunted, one of the games in GMT's Submarine series that began with The Hunters. Another war game on the list? Did it fare better than 65? <laughs> nope. The Hunted is another one that I didn't have very positive feelings for. Now, I tried to make it clear in my review that this was not a game for me, but I totally respect why others enjoy it, because it's basically rolling dice on a bunch of tables and letting the game take you for a ride and tell an intense story of survival, and I think that's cool, but personally, I want a few more choices, or at least a bit more theme. Uh, this one really relied on you to kind of, like, imagine what was happening, whereas something like Escape the Dark Sector has great illustrations to kind of lead you along. So this is one that I just didn't have too much interest in and didn't really tax my brain very much or make me too engaged in it, so I didn't keep it. And last we have Pendulum, the real-time competitive and solo game also from Stonemeyer. Scythe, considered by many to be the best Stonemeyer game, didn't make the cut, did Pendulum, which is not considered to be the best. 
No, of course not. So I've seen a lot of distaste and even outright hate for Pendulum from reviewers, but I was not that negative on it. I actually think the competitive play is pretty fun. But the solo play, just waiting and staring in an hourglass for you to take a single action or two that isn't really that engaging and then doing it again, oh my gosh, it was not a pleasurable experience. Not that interesting. It's not a good enough engine builder or tableau builder or anything kind of builder to justify the real-time element that feels tacked on and anti fun. So this one had to go as quickly as I could get rid of it. So there you go, another month of shelf life, and let me know which game surprised you the most in either direction. And hang on a minute if you want to hear about our contest and see who won, but until next month, I'll see you at the next stop. All right, and this will be a quick one. Out of about 150 entrants into the contest, we had two who got every single one right. 11 out of 11. Give me a break here. Uh, BJ Price and Suzanne Herman. And things are even simpler because Suzanne said that they didn't want to be entered into the contest. Just wanted to do it for the fun of it. So, BJ Price, you, with a perfect score, are our winner this month. So, congratulations, and I'll be contacting you soon. But thank you to everybody who entered. Uh, this was a fun one.